Well, good afternoon. Welcome to, uh, I won't say welcome to next because you've been welcomed a hundred times by now, but welcome to a really cool session. Uh, we're excited to have you here with us today. The session is like a topic that's on everybody's mind. It's security at scale, protecting America's largest city, featuring the New York City Cyber Command. So this is a fantastic session and we're really pleased to have you here with us. So my name is Ryan Mulholland and I serve on Google's public sector team uh, in professional services. Particularly, I serve only state and local government. So I'm very excited to introduce today's session because New York City happens to be one of those governmental entities that I get to work with on a pretty regular basis. New York City is America's largest city, the second largest in the world, with about 8.6 million residents, about 60 million visitors a year, and arguably one of the largest cyber targets in the world. It's genuinely a monumental task to provide security at that kind of scale, and the responsibility for that falls on New York City Cyber Command. It's my privilege to be their technical account manager, and it's equally my privilege to introduce our speaker for this session. Colin Ahern is the Deputy Chief Information Officer, or Chief Information Security Officer, and leading security sciences for the City of New York. Prior to joining New York City Cyber Command, uh, Colin served seven years as an officer in the U.S. Army, where he served two tours in Afghanistan and as a commander of the Cyberspace Operations Company. After serving the Army, Colin worked in the financial sector focused on security engineering and cyber threat intelligence. In addition to degrees from Tulane and NYU, Colin is a certified information systems security professional and a Google certified professional data engineer. Along with his wife and daughter, Colin lives in the bustling borough of Brooklyn, New York. Please help me welcome Colin Ahern to the stage. Big plate. Cool. Uh, here's what we're going to talk about today. Just a couple of things. I'm only going to talk for about 15 or 20 minutes via slides, then uh, we'll get into a good discussion. Uh, as Ryan mentioned, New York City is one of the mo most populous cities in the world. Uh, and if New York City were its own country, if all 8.6 million residents who live in the five boroughs, that's not including the 20 million in the major metro area, were their own country, they would be the size of the country of Austria. Uh, and as you can imagine, it takes an enormous amount of infrastructure uh, to serve that municipality. There's over 300,000 civil servants that work for the government of the city of New York. Uh, and if those civil servants somehow seceded and formed their own country, separate and apart from all other countries, they'd be the size of Iceland. So we're talking about an enormous, an enormous enterprise, an enormous undertaking. Uh, so I'm honored to talk to you about that today. Um, great. Uh, so as you can imagine, it takes a huge internet infrastructure to do all the things that you think of making New York City work happen. Uh, you see there on the left, the city of New York owns about 200,000 public-facing internet protocol addresses. That's a little over three slash 16s. Uh, and the government agency charged with defending that is New York City Cyber Command. Uh, and we're one year old this month. We were formed in July of last year by executive order by Mayor Bill de Blasio. And we're the government agency charged with defending the people and information systems that make the city the city. And what we're most focused on is ensuring that the services that residents depend on are reliable. And what's more reliable against intentional and unintentional misuse by actors who would wish to do the city harm, take the city's data, or otherwise misuse its systems. Uh, and we're a co-equal agency with other agencies. Importantly, the CIO, our closest partner at the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications. Uh, and with them and with our executive stakeholders, we are focused on adapting to emerging cyber threats. Uh, just over the last several days, there's been a number of important news items. The Department of Homeland Security announced that Russian actors had compromised the systems of critical infrastructure components. Uh, last week at the Aspen Institute, the Director of National Intelligence, Dan Coates, uh, said the lights are blinking red. So this is an important and timely problem. Uh, and it's one that is not going to be solved by one government agency, one cartoon figure in one slide, in one presentation. But what it is going to be solved by is a concerted effort among a number of different groups, governments, academia, and large multinational private sector organizations like Google and like others that we work with. Uh, and I think speaking about the evolution of cyber threats, just one small anecdote. 
Uh, who here has heard of Eternal Blue? Eternal Blue? One or two? So Eternal Blue, allegedly, is a national security agency cyber weapon that was misused by a alleged foreign government actors after being stolen from the National Security Agency. Uh, and, you know, so, and it has since been published on the internet. So just to recap, you Google Eternal Blue, download some GitHub code, and you have the same cyber weapon that the U.S. and Russian governments have funded at great expense. So the threat landscape has changed very, very dramatically just in the past several years. And this is a challenge that really all organizations face, and some of the initiatives we're gonna, I'm going to talk about today you know, directly address that. Uh, but before I get into that, I want to talk a little bit again about history and the history of computing in the city of New York. Uh, the city of New York, again, has you know, been a city for a, very, a really long time, and computers have been a part of providing uh, services to residents, visitors, and businesses uh, for more than 45 years. In fact, there is a civil servant working for the city who has been working on computers for more than 40 years. Not many technology companies can say that they have that kind of legacy. Now, that obviously poses interesting and important challenges, but that allows us a unique historical perspective on how everything old is new again. For example, uh, you know, we have containerized applications running in Google Container Engine. That being said, namespaces and C groups have been a thing that we've interacted with for a long time. Uh, and with a keen historical perspective, uh, I think we're able to make better decisions about the future. Uh, so who exactly is New York City Cyber Command and what do we do? Uh, so I want to talk about this in really three parts. New York City Cyber Command readies the city by directing citywide incident response and cyber defense. Number two, we set information security policies and standards and mandate the deployment of administrative and technical controls throughout city-owned systems. That includes strategic defensive technology and other processes and procedures that support them. Uh, and three, we advise the city's leadership on cyber defense and information risk and authorize cyber investment requests and ensure that they are efficient and economic. And I think what is important to touch upon and um, understanding how municipal governments work, the ability to unify these efforts is made much more straightforward by A, the executive support we have all the way to City Hall, and two, our relationship with the city's major technology provider and the Office of Management and Budget. And it might seem like a small thing, uh, but if you look back on the history of other efforts and other governments to do similar things, the lack of those two key elements can be a major stumbling block. So the fact that we were able to address them, I think, is very important. So I want to talk about three specific things we're doing. Uh, first, I want to talk about secure.nyc, uh, which is empowering New Yorkers with cybersecurity tools. Two, I want to talk about research and development. And last, and certainly not least, data science in the cloud, as you heard, I'm a Google certified professional data engineer, so data is a near and dear topic to my heart. Uh, so uh, I'll just take, a, just let you read this quote for a couple of seconds. Uh, Secure.nyc is really two things. Number one, it's a change in policy. It's bringing the commitment that we have to defend residents in their physical lives to the digital realm. And Number two, it's a series of specific tactics we're taking now and will take in the future in order to make that policy come to life. Uh, and really, the, what I want to spend a couple of seconds about is what we expect of ourselves as a government, what we expect of our community, and how we think that this is really transformative. Uh, we're the first municipal government to say that. We have a responsibility to defend you in cyberspace not just to bring to justice those actors who would, after you're victimized, but to provide you tools at no cost that respect your privacy is incredibly important. Uh, and we're not doing this alone. We have the opportunity to talk to Vince Cerf about this uh, initiative. Uh, and you guys, you can read the quote, this is a team sport, like I said. This isn't something that just New York City is gonna do by itself, this is something that we're gonna do together. Uh, and NYC Secure, the first tactic I want to talk just for a couple of seconds about is a free 
app that New Yorkers can download to warn you of unexpected activity on your mobile device and that recommends options to keep your device safe. If you're familiar with enterprise mobile threat defense technology, this is that, except that we have enjoined a third party to create this specifically with a wide range of important privacy protections. Not just via an end user license agreement, but via the inability of an application to collect any information kind whatsoever to send anywhere. So not just take our word that this is respecting your privacy, but that this app does not have the technical capability to move data of a sensitive nature off the device. Uh, and that's because we think that privacy and security are not orthogonal. We think that they are complementary. Uh, and this is part of the change that we want to see, not necessarily more of the same. Uh, and the second thing I want to talk about uh, is NYC Secure Wi-Fi. And NYC Secure Wi-Fi is a joint initiative between Quad9, or 9.9.9, uh, which is a recursive DNS filtering technology. By the end of the year, the city of New York on all publicly owned and operated Wi-Fi networks will have recursive DNS filtering technology either by Quad9 or by other partners that meet two criteria. One, respective of end user privacy, and two, filtering only known malicious uh, domain names. Uh, and that's not a panacea. There's a lot to providing secure Wi-Fi. But this is an important step in that if you are surfing the internet on your mobile device or your laptop, you should not be victimized by a known malicious domain name. And again, this is a, a tool that we partnered with Quad9 and the Global Cyber Alliance to make available, and we encourage other communities and other enterprises to use. Uh, and research and development. Uh, firstly, a plug. Uh, we are going to be at Usenext Security Symposium, uh, which is in Baltimore in August, so check us out. Um, and if we expect things to change, we need to engage with the academic community as a large municipality. Uh, and the two things I talk about here, one, uh, we're getting a paper published in Usenix, which is a peer-reviewed academic journal, which is the first quantitative effect of the study, uh, the first study quantitatively of the effect of digital threat modeling. And digital threat modeling for the uninitiated is the formal practice by which you put on your bad guy hat and you say, what if I wanted to destroy, disrupt, deny, or degrade the availability of this service or system. Again, this is a, in some ways a fundamental practice of many information security programs, and that's very important. But how important, and how important quantitatively? What we did in collaboration with the, the team at the University of Maryland was show its effect in two different areas. One, on our workforce, and two, on our ability to make more reliable the systems we're responsible for defending. I can't give away any more because you should totally come to Usenix because it's a really great conference. Um, and more, uh, whoever has heard of New York City Open Data, NYC Open Data? If you've ever gone to Kaggle, if you've ever taken a Coursera course, you've probably used New York City Open Data. New York City Open Data was one of the first open government data programs. Uh, it's been going on for about 12 or 15 years. Um, and our perspective is that our duty as civil servants is to make the maximum amount of data available that we can. Uh, obviously, we're security professionals, and our responsibility on ensuring the reliability of these systems comes first. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we can't have meaningful and interesting relationships with academic institutions like we did with the University of Maryland and like we do with other research institutions. So we actively collaborate with academia, and we have great relationships with them. Uh, and one of the really important things that we're undertaking is a research community centered around tackling really tough problems for large enterprises, in particular municipalities. Uh, and maybe in some ways uh, most interesting for this audience, a cloud-first strategy. So what is the difference between a cloud-ready application and a cloud-first application? Uh, that's something that I think a lot of enterprises are figuring out. Uh, but I think that really, when we take our core responsibility, our core responsibility as New York City Cyber Command is ensuring the reliable delivery of services to residents, visitors, and businesses. And how do we do that? Well, we need to make better decisions over time. Better decisions about what? Better decisions about the risks that are posed to our systems. And to do that, we need the right data in the right format to the right system at the right time. 
And that sounds easy, but that involves an incredible amount of work in extracting, normalizing, transforming, analyzing, and presenting an incredibly high volume of heterogeneous data across a wide array of information systems, ranging from connected devices, large mainframes, and you know, Google Container Engine, Kubernetes applications. Uh, and that's something that we're actively undertaking uh, you, you know, with, uh, with our joint city team. Uh, and we wanted to do that in a secure way. So one of the things that we have an opportunity as New York City Cyber Command, we're only a year old, so we get the opportunity to do new, interesting, and important things. And uh, two things we're doing are we're using the cryptographic identity assurance uh, provided by the FIDO UTF standard, uh, which if you're not familiar with, you should absolutely check out for your own organization. And we're implementing right now in production zero trust network architectures. In my opinion, uh, zero trust network architecture is the architecture of the future. Uh, it's not easy, it doesn't happen overnight, uh, but it is something that the city is actively working on um, and working with key partners, including Google, on moving that forward for the city. Uh, and scalable and open source, as I said, cyber is a machine speed problem. Uh, no more are the days where uh, you have hours, days, or weeks to solve problems, you have minutes or seconds or less. Uh, and community-driven resources at scale as the problem goes. Uh, there's a saying uh, in information security, if somebody knows more about your network than you do, it's not your network anymore, it's their network. So that means that we need to be better data professionals about our own systems, and that's something that uh, the open source community is working very hard on and that we're working on very hard on as well. Uh, and I talked about data-driven, uh, but data-driven for a particular purpose, maybe the most important decision uh, an information security program has. Many of you have security operations centers. We run the city's 24 by 7 security operations center, including tiers 1, 2, and 3 computer emergency response team. And if you've never heard of any of these terms, uh, who makes the decision in your organization whether an asset should be taken off the network or not? That is a decision that you should think very, very carefully about whether the person who is doing that has the right information. The right information about the asset, its criticality, its importance, what happens if you turn it off, what happens if you don't turn it off, and uh, an adversary is able to spread laterally through your network. These are really tough questions, and they're not questions that everyone gets right all the time. They're questions that you get better at over time by being honest with yourself and by managing your information systems appropriately. Uh, and I had to get a really awesome New York City picture uh, in here, and actually just under the R is Google's New York City office. So Google's a part of New York City. Uh, we're really you know, excited to have you. And what's more, if you think that you want to be a part of our team, we're actively growing, like I said, I dare you to try, nyc.gov slash jobs, keyword cyber. Uh, this is a team sport. There's a lot of ways to contribute. Uh, thanks. So we're going to have a bit of a moderated conversation up here for a few minutes, and then we'll open up to questions from the floor. Um, but I'll start with this. I, Google has had the privilege of working with you and your team almost since the time you guys became a team. Um, would you mind sharing a little bit about your experience with Google in that time? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that's unique about working uh, in New York City is the opportunity to work with really great technology providers, including Google. Um, and our experience with Google has been very favorable. Uh, you know, we, of course, work with all the major public cloud providers as a city, uh, but what we do with the Google team uh, is some of the most important things that we undertake as an organization, and we're incredibly pleased to have the relationship that we have. Awesome, thank you. So I, I, I've written out a few questions here because these are interesting, and I'm just kind of dying to hear your answer on some of them. So no gotchas, sorry. Sure, sure. Um, so security, in, in cybersecurity in particular, has always been as much a philosophical debate as it has been a practical challenge, and the challenge at scale when you're talking about New York City. Do you have any recommendations for the folks in the audience on how they might tackle this problem, much like you and your team have in New York? Sure. Um, so I think there's... You know, philosophically in the far reaches of history, cybersecurity wasn't a thing, it was called IT security, and it was a thing that sysadmins did, you know, on nights and weekends. Um, 
And what I think we're seeing is a philosophical evolution from cybersecurity as a beep bop boop computer thing to a risk management discipline. Uh, and that might sound like maybe yeah, that sounds a little too abstract to have meaning. Um, but instead of being a thing where the technology is an end unto itself, the technology is a means by which some outcome is achieved, some desired level of surety or reliability in a system. Uh, and I think some of the disciplines that have informed cybersecurity over the past 10 or so years that I've been in the community uh, have been systems engineering and reliability engineering. Because when you think about it, the most important property of a system is how reliable it is. And in cybersecurity, how reliable against what? Intentional and unintentional misuse. Misuse by who? Everybody. Because computers as state machines only do precisely what you tell them. They don't do what you would like them to do. They do what you, would t what you tell them to do. Uh, and given the complexity of many internet-connected and internet-facing systems, uh, that means that no one person, entity, product, or service provider can understand the totality of this system. It means it's not deterministic in nature. This problem is probabilistic. And that's a fancy way of saying you're going to mess it up. Uh, but you want to contain both the frequency and magnitude of these inevitable events so that they don't become an incident. Uh, and I'm using language from the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which is an incredibly important part of this community and I think is getting more say in terms of the NIST cybersecurity framework, which is great. Uh, but there's another side of it, the black hats, the purple hairs, uh, and that's important too. Uh, one of the things that you see uh, emerging is kind of the push and pull between a compliance-driven framework, where NIST CSF is an incredibly powerful tool, uh, but it doesn't say what the bad guys are trying to do to you, right? It only says, here are all the tools at your disposal that we think can help ensure the reliability or surety of your system. It doesn't say that bad guy over there is going to try to steal this file to sell it on the internet. That's something that you as a system owner or the executive stakeholder are going to have to do. And I think one thing has changed that dramatically is the rise of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrency. It used to be that monetizing stuff on the internet was really hard. There was a you know, gift card, and I spent some time in financial services, as you heard. Uh, so there's a kind of a, a lot of prior art around how criminal groups monetize or mon you know, monetize information. Uh, but the TLDR of that is Bitcoin. Now the answer is Bitcoin. Uh, and that means that as more information becomes present on more networks, and on top of that, more and more sophisticated tools are available, if you would Google Eternal Blue, you'll be as powerful as the NSA. That's crazy. And I, 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 you know, kind of combined with the fact that you can now pseudonymously monetize that information with great ease, uh, that creates a really different um, dynamic than we've seen really in, in even the past five years. So you touched on an interesting topic uh, about, you know, effectively cyber weapons being released to the general public and made available to any bad actor on the, mm -hmm. any corner of any street. Um, and probably before that was maybe Stuxnet. And there's a lot of, you know, supposition in, in terms of where Stuxnet came from. It was the first, I think, mm -hmm. classified cyber weapon mm -hmm. that was released and uh, it was used effectively by whoever used it. There's suspicions, right? But that was really the beginning of, of cyber warfare mm -hmm. in real terms. And how do you how do you tackle that? We, you have hundreds of thousands of devices, hundreds of thousands of employees, um, 8.6 million residents, 20 or pardon me, 60 million visitors to New York City, and we now have cyber weapons. How do you possibly face that challenge? Well, I'd say a couple things. One, we work very very closely with cyber is unique in that it is still and hard to believe in our current in our current political climate an apolitical topic. We work very closely with the state of New York and the federal government, Department of Homeland Security, and other entities throughout the interagency on ensuring that our systems are as reliable as they can. Uh, two, we try to reduce our mean time to respond to the absolute minimum that we can. We use very, you know, the, every tool at our disposal to ensure that we're finding, fixing, and removing from our networks malicious events before they arise to the level of incident. Um, and that is because we, you know, we work hard at it every day, and obviously that's not to say something unfortunate couldn't occur because it could. Um, and I think that in meaningful terms, 
uh, that's something that we work very hard at, and we'll just have to continue to do that. Sure. So you you actually mentioned a phrase. You and I have had conversations about you know what Google put out in terms of Beyond Corp, mm -hmm. but you mentioned a phrase to the audience with us today: uh, zero trust networks. Can you talk a little bit more about what you mean by zero trust and yeah. its effect? Sure. So, um, who's heard of the ARPANET? ARPANET? Actually, interesting, the uh, Stanford Research Institute, which is right here, connected with UCLA. The first two connections on the internet actually happened in the city of San Francisco and the city of Los Angeles. The third one was in DC, and like the fifth or sixth was the city of New York, was New York University. Right. So, the internet. Uh, and back in the good old days, the routing table in my office, as you've seen, uh, we have an actual logical internet map uh, from like 1969, and there's like 18 things on it. Uh, and back in those days, uh, you, there was no such thing as network address translation. All of the routes were, pu were public and transparent. Uh, and as the ARPANET kind of subsumed other nets, uh, it became necessary for some networks to be private. RFC 1918 and other things. Uh, and that gave rise to network address translation, private IP space, and all these other things. Uh, but as the internet grew in sophistication, size, and importance, these networks were bridged. And networks that people previously had not, could, couldn't imagine in a thousand years that you would connect this to the internet, they became connected to the internet. So one of the you know, key assumptions embedded in RFC 1918 and RFC, I think it's 35, 18 or 65, which is the internet threat model, uh, is that private IPs will remain private. And obviously, as, you know, as information security professionals or really people uh, who are around today, that's not an assumption that really we can make reliably over time. So a zero trust network is one in which the network you are on has no or very little bearing upon the access and authorization decision to a system resource. Uh, so more formally, uh, an access and authorization decision is a, the result of your assurance about the identity of the requester and the device that the request is originating from, combined with the resource being requested. You know, if we think about subject, resource, object, and these other, uh, these other models, um, those are ones at which, over time, uh, you can have much more reliably and much more effectively uh, accurate determinations of trust. Uh, I think I dropped out speaking of trust. Uh, so what we're trying to do is get the most accurate determination of trust for our request. Uh, and one of the things, if you haven't read uh, Zero Trust Network, the, uh, the O'Reilly book or the great white papers that the Google team has put out, uh, this is a thing that acknowledging that your systems are connected to the internet, then what? And that's really where Zero Trust Networking comes from. Uh, and that's why we think it's so interesting. Cool. So to shift gears on you just a little bit and focus on kind of this broad mission that you've got and, and you've been in now for a year, um, you're doing a lot of work, right? You and the teams that are involved, you run the data sciences team and engineering folks. There's a CERT team. There's other folks that are involved in, in providing security for New York. But you're working on a number of fronts to build out tools and resources to better help detect and mitigate bad actor attacks against the city of New York. While you're busy, and this gets on the technical side a little bit, while you're busy working on building out those tools and resources, how do you avoid getting blinders to other opportunities to do important things as they may seep into conversations? How do you avoid getting blinded to the ability to do other things beyond what your key focus is? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think it's something that, you know, in every organization's evolution, they have to tackle this problem. It's like, what is the business that we're in? And we're in the business of reliability. New York City Cyber Command is in the business of reliable systems. Uh, and what, like, but what systems? And the systems that make New York City, New York City. So that's not just computer systems. That's how the civil servants interact with those systems. That's how our residents, visitors, and businesses interact with our systems. So what really led us to NYC Secure, along with uh, the mayor and the other executive team from City Hall, uh, was the understanding that we're part of a larger system of systems and we have a responsibility to move this whole system forward and not just remain focused on making a green light stay blinking green. 
uh, but to take a long-term view and to build processes and muscle memory as an organization that will continue, that will enable us over time uh, to take risks in a space where, um, you know, remaining agile and taking risks are, are important determinants for success. Great. So as you've been working with Google and Google Cloud and, and the products that we offer in Google Cloud, are there any of those that have caught you by surprise that you didn't expect to find that have been kind of, aha, that's cool, we can make use of that kind of a thing? Yeah, I think that the New York City, you know, uh, kind of goes without saying that there's a lot to New York City. Uh, but one of the things that we, you know, the tools to, you know, if you kind of imagine like the, I spent a little bit of time talking about our data problem. Uh, and one of the things we really uh, like is Google's commitment to open sourcing some of the interesting things that they've done, uh, including Kubernetes, including Apache Beam and other things. Uh, so that's been exciting for us to work with the Google team on some of these tools that they are open sourcing uh, because that's an important part of our commitment as civil servants. So that's, that's been great. Awesome. So kind of last thing before we open it up to questions from the audience. You've got a big mission in front of you. You've been at it for a year. How important for organizations that are kind of going to undertake or are in the process of undertaking a similar mission for where they are, how important is executive sponsored at, sponsorship to actually getting the work done? I think it is very important. Um, we're spoiled, frankly, in that we have a, a very strong working relationship with the executives at City Hall. Uh, we have an incredible amount of executive support. Um, in fact, I encourage you to read Executive Order 28 if you're like a policy wonk type person. Uh, it's a really powerful document. It's only two pages. And we think that it really formed, you know, we think of it like our constitution. Um, and, but that isn't, you know, just having executive support isn't enough. You need to build a culture as a team of teams. You know, it sound a little hokey, I guess. Uh, so we need to build a cult, the culture of an organization willing to take risks to move the city forward. And we need to interact, you know, to work with the interagency. Uh, because New York City has over 100 different agencies, from the New York City Police Department to the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. You know, we have organizations that are hundreds of years old and have tens of thousands of people, and organizations that have dozens of people and were just created. Uh, so that's an incredible spectrum. And in your organization, you probably have similar things. You probably have large, sophisticated components of your organization. You have components that you're just starting or you're just doing a new thing with, or maybe you're just a new organization yourself. Um, and I think it's really about not what should I do, but what should I do next. Uh, and you know, there's no replacing the fundamentals. Uh, and I think keeping focused on what are the actual determinants of the reliability of your system, and what are the actual bad guys targeting you actually trying to do. Uh, and that's not an impossible question to answer. I, you know, I came, I come from a cyber threat intel background. You know, that's a discipline that I think is really, really important. Uh, because at the end of this, this is about people on computers. And at the other end of the computer, there's another person. And what does that person want? What are they trying to do? Uh, and for many organizations, that's a relatively straightforward question to ask. If you have a lot of credit cards or information that's easy to monetize, they're probably trying to take it and monetize that. Uh, but if you provide a critical service, if you're a critical infrastructure provider, probably some adversary is trying to hold you at risk. They're trying to gain leverage over you over some future unknown time. Um, but those are both problems that can be addressed in sophisticated ways uh, and can be addressed by organizations taking a long-term view about moving their culture forward. Uh, Astro Teller uh, had a great keynote um, that maybe you watched that, you know, culture is a result of the incentives that you put in an organization. Uh, and information security is, as a risk management discipline, uh, isn't like buying a toothbrush. It's like brushing your teeth. So if you're the organization that thinks that you're just going to buy a bunch of cyber toothbrushes, and hand them out, and that's going to be cyber. That's not what it's like. It's about changing a culture to move people into the habits of acknowledging the risks that these systems are being acted upon by you know, bad people both on the internet and maybe even inside your own organization. Awesome. So this is a pretty complex topic, and we wanted to leave enough time at the end here for the audience to ask any questions that you may have. If you're able, there are microphones on either side uh, right about the sea level. We'd really welcome any questions from the audience. And if you can do it at the microphone, that's awesome. If you can't holler it out, we'll repeat it over the microphone. But we'd like to hear your questions for Colin.
And I, one question I usually like to start out with, how did I get that great animated character thing? Fiverr, that's the answer. Everybody's curious. I, I uh, am training new uh, hires in um, software. And a lot of times, the easiest things to do are not the most secure. And security isn't always um, intuitive. So um, when you're bringing new people on, how can you um, keep them aware of those things without um, maybe making them feel like they're, uh, I don't know, in over their head? Right, that's a great question. So for those that couldn't hear, how do you train new hires, in particular software engineers, uh, about how to do things in a, the good, secure way Vice the, well, just give the web app admin to the SQL server, I've heard it's fine. Or, you know, I'm not, I don't know what your, what your stack is. Um, but broadly speaking, um, it's a balance. You need to balance the velocity of your development, your capabilities as an organization, uh, with the maturity of your processes and technology. What I think is really interesting is that it's really, really easy now, we're at Google Next, to use some of the most sophisticated technology on the planet. Uh, it's not like you have to go buy some hardware from Micro Center and put it in a colo. You know, those days are kind of gone. Um, so that's really interesting and important. Uh, there's a lot of open source information uh, from the Open Web Application Security Framework, OWASP, uh, to the 12-factor web application. Uh, there's a lot of communities. There's InfoSec meetups here in San Francisco that have been around for many, many, many years. Um, and you have, I think the important thing is to uh, have people, you know, kind of acknowledge uh, that writing, you know, putting it in the context of a reliable service, I think is really fundamental. Uh, because saying that this is security and you have to do it is a conversation that's really hard to have. Uh, but saying that we want to build a product that is going to stand the test of time, including things that we foresee and don't foresee, that's the kind of engineer that, you know, appeals to me as an engineer, but I think, you know, appeals to your team to say, like, we're not just going to be, you know, swagging code. We're going to be writing things that matter. We're going to be writing things that persist. We're going to comment our functions. You know, we're going to have good, good commit flags, all that stuff. Um, and that really comes from acknowledging that um, decisions we make in haste, absent some context, uh, are really important. So establishing the context of the world around your system and not all systems are the same. Uh, and using as many proven open source technologies that are well covered, uh, that are well used, that get reliable security patches, I think is, is another tactical thing. Hi. Uh, currently, is there any roadmap with your organization to reach out to sister cities to replicate this and perhaps divide and conquer in terms of the development workload? Yeah, that's a, a great question. Um, we've had a number of discussions um, with, there's actually the uh, Multi-State Information Sharing and Analysis Center, it's called MSISAC, it's actually run out of Albany, uh, so that's a formal information, and ISAC, if you haven't heard the term, is the, uh, it has a number of agency participants, so we work with MSISAC, which is the formal body with which state and local governments come together to share things. So we have those deliberate sharing relationships. Um, and that's something that absolutely we want to explore how to best do that in the future. So not something we've done aside from the established channels that already exist in the community, uh, but something that we're, we're looking at, yeah. Hello. Thank you for your talk, by the way. So my question is more towards, it sounds like you're using some of Google's newer tools. You're running GKE, so your developers have container experience, probably building applications that run and probably also need to be secure. So what does it look like for you to build security into the new workflow that developers are undergoing? Because like security is a fairly well-known process when it comes to the virtual machine because they've been around for 20 years. But containers, I mean, there's a brand new way to sign images and other things and crap like that every five seconds. And and then there's a new service mesh that has different MTLS capabilities in between these two types of containers. So what what have you guys done to assess that challenge and then not to slow down developers at the same time? Yeah, so I think maybe taking a step back, how do we both use new tools on the one hand and not get pwned on the other hand, just to kind of level set? Uh, and we do that by approaching this as really a fundamental software engineering problem. Uh, it requires you know, good dev leads who 
know the code, who know the team, who understand the problem. You know, the secret is there is no secret. Uh, Kubernetes is namespaces and C groups, among other things. Uh, so you need to have a development team that understands the fundamentals uh, that they're working with. And I think, um, you know, kind of at this core, uh, this is a problem that requires a, a sophisticated, you know, one of the things we look for in developers is understanding of fundamental um, data types, hash maps, B trees, uh, things like that, uh, because these are the fundamental underpinnings of a lot of the, you know, because we're you know, mostly doing data E things. Uh, and so an understanding of the fundamentals of what makes these uh, compiled and uncompiled languages work and function, uh, and how those fit into the picture of the service offering that we're interacting with. Um, so we have you know, very strict code review guidelines. We have, um, we have an, a, you know, for a young organization, a very strong post-mortem culture. Uh, we have sophisticated testing tools and development environments. That's one thing that the cloud is good for. Uh, is having a really sophisticated and well-metered testing environment. Um, uh, and it's just having a commitment to following the process and when that process isn't followed, having a mechanism by which people are rewarded for saying, yep, that was me, I checked it in, yep, I did that. Uh, because like I said, this is a team sport that it is important to get it right, but we need to move at the speed of our adversary. So. Um, I don't have some, like a one answer or one piece of kit that we've done, uh, but just an approach to fundamental software engineering I think is important. Is, even though these new tools are cool and awesome, and they really are, uh, there's, no, there's no getting around. Like If you look at code as a code reviewer and the comments aren't very good, then you, I don't need to go check Google, the Google container. I, I just know that this isn't gonna, it's not gonna, that dog's not gonna hunt. From the far side there. Yeah, favorite. Yeah. Do you have a favorite uh, post-mortem or unexpected learning moment that you can share? <laughs> Our favorite unexpected learning moment. Um, yeah, I'll have to be a little oblique, um, but we had an unexpected learning moment when it comes to uh, always checking the spam folder and ensuring that uh, we're communicating appropriately with all of our stakeholders. Uh, you can imagine we deal with a lot of stakeholders in a lot of different places, uh, but we had, you know, we have a team that like ruthlessly gets to the root of interesting problems, and that's you know the kind of team you want, not just as any technology company, but especially uh, as a cybersecurity organization. So we're racking our brains with like, why didn't this thing occur at the time we thought it was going to occur? And we were looking at a lot of really complicated, maybe it bounced off the Coke machine and into the window, and then that's what happened. Or, but it really turned out that somebody didn't check their spam folder. That's it. That's it. Somebody didn't check their spam folder. So we spent hours and hours, you know, we're 11 p.m. in the office trying to figure this thing out. Able, you know, fortunately, we came to this conclusion, we're able to uh, make the right thing happen in this instance. Uh, but sometimes, you know, if you've ever you know, been a sysadmin, did you check the connection? Did you restart it? You know, kind of like doing these fundamental troubleshooting steps. Uh, so that was kind of our favorite. We had all kind of crazy theories of why this was going to happen, or why this thing was unfolding or not, but that's the reason. Kind of tailing off that, do you all have publicly posted postmortems anywhere? We do not. Um, that's something that we are uh, looking into. We do share our postmortems internally with our agency stakeholders. Um, and that's not something we've ruled out, but that's not something we've undertaken yet. Good question. Yes, hello. Thank you very much for coming. So there's a lot of um, people that have come to the Google conference um, that are either a startup or have very limited security resources. They're not going to be able to have the resources of you know, a major city. Um, what would you say to those people that maybe can only do you know, three to five things with one person? What, what would be your most important things to, to put forth? Yeah, I would say, um, one, use as many well-cared-for managed service offerings as possible. As a small organization, as a growing company, uh, every moment you're not delivering product is a problem. Like, it's a problem for you as a product owner, it's a problem for you as an engineer. 
uh, and really focusing on the kind of where your added value is. Uh, and there was a panel yesterday where uh, Nelson Moe, who is the CIO of the Commonwealth of Virginia, said, the Commonwealth of Virginia doesn't add value in you know, virtual machines. We add value in understanding what our constituents want and delivering applications that meet their needs and these other things. Uh, so I would say you know, the movement to the public cloud is an understanding that as a community, we can engage resources together to achieve better outcomes. So to, you know, to kind of state it differently, I'd use managed service offerings. Uh, and two, count, configure, control, patch. Uh, there's, you know, those are the kind of the basic tenets of cybersecurity. You need to have an awareness of what resources are being put where, uh, how they're configured, and what it means to configure something securely. There's a ton of resources, actually, again, with uh, NIST, if you're dealing with well-known application type things like Windows SQL Server and other things, you know, there are known best practice configuration for those services. Uh, and if you're building a new service, do a, uh, you know, do a red team exercise. You don't even have to do a red team exercise like hire at great expense some pen tester, but just go into a room with a whiteboard, a couple of adult beverages and a pizza and say, what if, you know, Johnny, tomorrow said he's going to take down our whole system, what would he do? And just, you know, capture, because the kind of devs that are engineering this thing, uh, they know its weaknesses. They know the things that, you know, the buffer overflows, the memory leaks, uh, you know, the, the listing force that don't need to be there. You know, the, the knowledge is there. Uh, so I think it's a couple hours of doing, you know, a threat modeling exercise, which again, there are good resources online for how to like, as a facilitator to lead this and other stuff. Uh, so I do a threat modeling exercise, or also you know, a pre-mortem, if you will, uh, and then use that to kind of prioritize where you're going to want to get better over time. And again, it's not like, you know, it's like brushing your teeth. It's something that has to be a repeated thing. It's not something that like, okay, Paul did that on a Thursday, so that's good for the quarter. It's going to have to be a continual thing. Uh, because like we want to build reliable services. You know, at its heart, I think as engineers, we, you know, that really motivates people. And if you put this in the context of, you know, look, we're going to put this on the internet and people are going to use it and people are going to misuse it, then what does that mean? So, and those are things that, you know, you can do in an afternoon, some of them. Given kind of the universally understood, you know, our users are probably our greatest security risk. What about something as simple as a security key with G Suite? Yep. I think that uh, what can you trust? You can trust math. Right until quantum computers come and totally, you know, change the universe and public key crypto, which is actually really interesting. Uh, I'm also a crypto nerd, among other things. Um, so I think that public key cryptography. When you talk about public key cryptography, it sounds dense and maybe boring. But what if I told you about a magic tool that could allow you to trust somebody you've never met? For the whole of human history, trust was based on a personal relationship. But since public key cryptography, it has been based on a mathematical thing. Uh, and what I think is interesting about security keys is how can we apply this key insight, this like magic thing, uh, to securing our identities. Uh, and one of those things is FIDO and the FIDO Alliance, which Google is an important member of, along with other uh, corporations. Uh, and the FIDO 2 standard is coming out soon, I think September, and is super, super awesome, and you should check it out. Um, but yeah, the kind of magic of the internet is that you can just trust a person that you never met, and that's crazy. Uh, so we should be using that same crazy awesome thing to secure ourselves. So we have about 100, uh, a minute, 20 seconds left for a, a last question. If you can ask a quick one, awesome. Yeah, I was wondering if you're using any um, AI or machine learning technology for threat prediction or anything else. Uh, yes, and I think that you know we have a we have a data we have a chief data scientist uh, who's fantastic, uh, and he would very much want us to disambiguate statistical analysis, machine learning, and artificial intelligence uh, because I think it is important uh, because at its core you know we're trying to find the most efficient tool to answer our question, uh, and the complexity of that question is the determinant of the tool we use. Some questions can be answered with a heuristic. Is this URL on some blacklist? I don't need an AI to answer that. I need a lookup done. Uh, but other questions are more complex. Is this process injecting some other process, and what does that mean? 
Uh, and that's something that you know we do use with vendor partners and some homegrown stuff. Uh, you know, the gamut of the tools that one would expect of a data science team. So, uh, Colin, we really appreciate you being here with us at Next. Thank you for all the information, answering all the questions. Um, we enjoyed having you. We look forward to the conversation next year. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.